Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Your Flow, Factors and Approaches to Effective Workshop Engagement. Our presenter this afternoon is Dr. Karen Gunn, a well-respected professor um, from Santa Monica College, now retired. And without further ado, I am going to turn over the presentation to Dr. Gunn. Thank you, Scott. I'm glad to see all of you here. And in fact, uh, I seem to recognize a couple of faces who might have been in one of my sessions last week uh, on implicit bias. So I want to welcome some of you who dare to return. I hope that's a sign that you became comfortable with my style and welcome all of you who are new, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, this is sometimes the dead spot <laughs> uh, that some of us might say exists if we are trainers and facilitators. Um, it is where, based on what's happened over the last 18 months, we sometimes find people on Friday afternoon who are part of what we might consider the zombie apocalypse, not zombie, but zombie. So I've got two hours to pro provide you with uh, some food for thought. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's about finding your flow. I'm gonna get a little bit more specific and say it's really about finding your hustle and flow. And by that, I mean, uh, in terms of finding that hustle is uh, being able to push yourself, apply yourself, press on in terms of who you are, be you, and, and doing that in an effective way. And also about the flow, which is how you migrate or translate how you conduct yourself into engagement with other people so that things occur as smoothly and as effortly as effortlessly as possible. But before we get started, I would like to ask you to just kind of make sure you're settled in your seat. Um, if you have a piece of paper or a pen and a pencil or a pen, that would be great. And I wanna check in with you. So I'm putting a question in the chat that I'd like you to take a look at and then um, put in a number from one to five. So how are you at the moment? At 2.04 on a Friday afternoon on the 17th of September, 2021. One being low, energy's not too high. Five being you're doing the happy dance. Um, you're on top of the world. So I'm seeing a lot of threes. And I can understand some of you may have even joined this after working. Nice to see that there are a few fours. It's cool like that. Ooh, we got some twos, we got some fives. Give everyone else a chance to throw something in if uh, you would like. It helps me to understand um, how hard of a happy dance I'm gonna have to do to keep you engaged. My guess is based on what I'm seeing here, people, you know, the average might be about 3.5 or something like that. My training is as a psychologist. I'm originally from Michigan. I went to the University of Michigan. And as Scott said, I uh, am a retired professor in the psychology department at a little college north of you all called Santa Monica College. And during that time, I also served as the chair. And as a way to perhaps, um, let you know who I am also in terms of the understanding of what the classified professionals do on every campus. I can say to you quite candidly that were it not for all of the wonderful people on the classified side at Santa Monica College when I began my work and particularly when I became chair, I would not have survived. Uh, I respect the professionalism that you bring to your job and I appreciate the fact that actually the classified professional staff touch every corner of every campus. And in many ways, you are out and about rocking and rolling, hopefully, um, 
and know what's going on and what the, what the campus is like, how it operates, what are the challenges, in some ways much more intimately than people who are in the classroom, who are on the academic side. And frankly, I would like some of my academic colleagues, past and present, to appreciate the value uh, that you bring to the campus. And in the South Orange County Community College District, you all are almost half of all the employees, 47%. So you are a significant segment um, of the population and I respect that. Let me just see again how folks are doing here. We're getting, okay, we got some fours in the last uh, uh, contribution to the chat. So I'm glad that you all, um, are here and I uh, hope that you will remain as energized as possible or even up the ante just a bit. So again, hustle and flow. Those of you in movies uh, or pay attention to them may actually know that there was a movie called Hustle and Flow uh, a few years ago. The subject matter there is not the subject matter here. If you're familiar with the movie, we're gonna do something else a little bit higher end if you will. So I'm gonna switch to a question. I would like everyone, if you can, to go to the poll. There is a question. The question is what is most important for building great teams? And if you could just quickly get to that poll and select one of the four options, We'll be able to see what you think. Thank you, Scott. Um, all you have to do is choose one of those four choices. You can't pick them all and submit your answer. I'm gonna allow about uh, a minute for everyone to weigh in. This is a way for you to get engaged, kind of energize yourself so you're not just sitting there passively listening to my voice. One minute, quick poll. Please let us know what you think. <clears throat> Does anyone have a question about how to contribute to the poll? I think we've got familiarity. Give you another uh, 30 seconds. All right, Scott, let's see what we've got. And uh, the results should be able to be shared. Aha, thank you, Scott, for that. So everyone, take a look. This is, the, this is what the uh, wisdom in the room, this particular room, is all about. Um, and what you see is what you get. Looks like motivation is taking... Uh, the largest percentage of folks answers about what's most important followed by leadership. And you can see the other two as well, vision and expertise. Thank you so much uh, for participating. And let me see if I can make sense of this. Yeah. So every option on that poll actually makes a difference. Makes a difference in terms of engagement, makes a difference particularly in terms of teams. And I wanted to wed those two areas of implication because in many ways, developing the ability, the capacity to engage with people effectively also has a positive side effect, which is that interpersonal engagement that is effective also tends to dribble over into how teams work. And it's my suspicion that all of you that are here 
when you go back to your job, what it is that you do, you're involved with other people, people that you may work with in a department, uh, people that you may work with in terms of a project, people that you engage in terms of the area of responsibility that you have. And that's across the board. If you work in uh, academic affairs, DSPS, if you're involved with heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, if you are um, dealing with landscaping and irrigation, you got to figure it out. There are very few places where a person works in complete solitary involvement. Uh, the, the three that you see at the bottom that are starred are the areas that I'm going to devote most of today about. And clearly in another moment, at another time, the other issues around vision and clarity, oftentimes about clarity of roles and responsibilities, and certainly leadership are very important. Uh, I'm, I'm focused today on those other three things. And as we move on into the rest of the session, I'm sure that there are things that you're thinking about that relate to leadership or clarity or vision. And we're gonna focus on some things that you can focus on on an individual basis and use um, this opportunity to explore those a little bit more. So at this point, Scott, I am gonna stop the share. I have two videos that I'd like to share with you and he's uh, in control of that. And I'd like him to share the first one and it'll lead us into the next segment. Scott is gonna pull up the video for us. It's relatively brief. Got you there. Yes, I'm pulling it up for you. Okay. Thank you. Oops. Just a bit of a teaser. It's a short one. Um. Bear with us folks, it is Friday and we're interfacing between two systems. There we go. Thank you. Well, how does this engineer comedian thing work? I don't know what people think. Uh, but really the only thing that makes me different than most comics is I have a lot of grass and charts. In fact, I'm wearing grass paper for my shirt. Look at that. <laughs> my favorite shirt. For example, uh, as I was driving here from Valencia, I'm sitting uh, on the freeway and I realized I had time. There is a map to LA traffic. Check this out. I really think this out. Check this out. You take the traffic on the 10, add the traffic on the 60, add the traffic by 5 plus the traffic at 57 plus the 55. Then add the traffic at the 90 plus the 91 plus the traffic on the 15 plus the traffic on the 22, and you get the traffic on 405. Thank you, Scott. This is, uh, as we transition back, um, certainly I would suspect that that's an experience many of you have or have had. And in fact, um, the, the experience tapped into various freeways that run through the, at least the four county uh, area of Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino, San Bernardino, Riverside. And I imagine many of you experience this on a daily basis, especially because I suspect many of you commute uh, from your home to your place of work. So as I move into this subject matter here of emotional intelligence, I want you to keep that video in mind because it does reflect what is a common experience. It also means that individuals arrive at work sometimes stressed out precisely because of that kind of experience. They're on edge, they might be a bit angry, they're frustrated, they could be late, they've been inconvenienced. And in fact, in some cases, especially with the 405, 
which is numbered that way because it takes four or five hours to get almost anywhere. That as you arrive at your place of work with this uh, traffic nightmare that you've gone through, and as you walk in, you hear on your traffic station, your radio station or uh, whatever it is, ways that the reason for your traffic jam that morning is because an emu was on the freeway uh, involved with the slow speed chase. Now, emus are those birds that, if you're familiar with the Liberty Mutual commercial that are tall, have wings that serve no purpose. And this is a true story that two years ago today, a runaway emu led the California Highway Patrol on a 30 minute pursuit down the 99 in the Central Valley part of California. So you also are walking in as a person, an individual, mystified about the reason for the bad traffic on this particular day. So when you walk in, you're holding all of those emotions, that whole set of emotions. And at that moment, back to healthy engagement, would be the time to, if you can, slow your roll to understand the cause of your upset, the fact that it's agitated you, that you might have sweat on your brow, that you're kind of like your heart is pumping because you're walking into a meeting about an important project with your team. And you need to be able, social science research would say, to put those emotions in the right place so they don't dribble over into your engagement in that moment. And sometimes that's hard to do. And in fact, many of us know and have had the experience of someone who walks into work carrying a heavy load, whether it's traffic, whether it's challenges in the community, whether it's something that's happened that's brought, gotten your attention, uh, the demands of your, your home, and you're carrying that weight right here on your shoulders. Not only on your shoulders, but what we also know, it often can be seen in your facial expression, uh, whether there's sort of pep in your step and glide in your slide, whether you got uh, and are exuding what looks like a positive vibe or something other than that. So one of the important parts of emotional intelligence, which can be measured as EQ, E is in Edward, Q is in quick. Um, and there are a lot of assessments for that. One of the major pieces of this is to be aware and to then not only be aware of how you're feeling, but to manage it. And to manage it is to be able to honestly, authentically and accurately deal with what the source is. So you don't direct how you feel to a source that had nothing to do with it. Really important in terms of engagement, to which we can add the other half of emotional intelligence is social awareness. It is also, here's where we go to the flow. Uh, how well you're able to navigate social situations. So I'm not talking about that, you know, just the party at the end of the week with the folks that you hang out with, the meals that you have with your family, those are social situations. And we know how they can go one way or the other. It is the workplace. The workplace is a social situation. Again, unless you are operating in exclusive solitude, you are navigating around other people who you engage in a variety of ways. They are your coworkers with whom you have a direct involvement. They are the larger group, that 47% of uh, South Orange County Community College District. You're also passing them uh, as you go to work in the cafeteria, now that you're back to work, uh, those kinds of things. So they are social situations. So we think about someone who experienced the 22, the 57, the 55, and they come in and they've got to deal with managing how they feel. That same person walks into a meeting 
where all of those other folks present will also have to work with, hopefully in an effective way, an individual who's got some things that they're trying to manage. And the individual has also got to figure out how to fit in, get in and fit in and roll past. There we go again, hustle, flow to roll past, past all of that so that they can uh, be an active, helpful member of the meeting that they're in. It can be a challenge and it doesn't, this, this EQ, emotional intelligence, isn't something that is innate. It is something that has to be worked on. And as I shared with you, um, and you consider it, understand and appreciate that getting to a place where you can do this with facility and flexibility takes time, takes practice, takes motivation. Remember one of those characteristics uh, for engagement and for teams. If you do it well, engagement can occur um, in sort of like that effortless, slow, smooth kind of way. Now, what's one of the things, what's one of the areas that's connected to all of this? Because uh, we, in our self-awareness, we communicate internally with ourselves. And with engagement and situational stuff, you are communicating with other folks. So this is an important aspect of building up that emotional intelligence facility or ability. It is to understand that we uh, come with a preferred style of communication. And whatever is our preferred, I am not saying that you can't display one or the other of the four that you see here up on uh, the screen. I am simply suggesting you have a comfort zone one, one that is where you usually default. And it also means that in terms of that preferred style, sometimes there can be friction when you are engaging someone who has a different preferred style that they are demonstrating. I wanna make sure as I talk about this that you understand I'm gonna be describing them in general. I wanna be sure that you understand that I am not suggesting nor does anybody else who's an expert in interpersonal communication that there's a right or wrong one. Do not take away that idea because that's not what I am suggesting. Um, I am saying that there's something we like a little better than the other. There's one that we present more often than the other. And I also want to say that people adapt. So sometimes the question is, you know, can you have more than one style? My answer to that question is you can display more than one. And the point here is to understand there's one you prefer. So now the question becomes, what the heck are these four things? Now there are other ways to uh, assess, to define types of styles. I would suggest to you that these four are often considered in any of the models. And if you wanna try to check out what yours is, I, there's so many options. I'll say what we already know. You can Google and you can explore. And exploration, hopefully with a credible source, might give you some of that information for the self-awareness that would be helpful in terms of that emotional intelligence. So what's a direct communication style? It's a style where a person expresses themselves in a what I would call a fairly straightforward way. They communicate with a focus perhaps on moving things along and what might seem like a quote unquote logical progression. There is an attention to doing things in the interest of saving time. 
there is a value on getting something done and they communicate with those things reflected. There is a tendency to do what we call get to the point. So again, make a little note. Uh, if you care to mental, or even if you care to write it down, I may ask you a couple of questions afterwards. An indirect communication style is one where the person we could say values creating a sense of harmony in the social situation. They're sensitive to how others feel. They are thoughtful in how they communicate because they are a priority for them is assuring that they don't say anything that embarrasses someone else. In uh, certain sort of philosophical fields of thought, it's about saving face um, and not doing anything that might be interpreted as, as an embarrassment or shaming. So there is, um, a way of talking about things that isn't completely focused the way a direct communication style person might display. An intuitive communication style is one where an individual in a particular in a social situation may sit in quiet contemplation as people are talking. They uh, may be more reflective they may ponder what is being discussed in a meeting without necessarily talking out loud or speaking to what is being discussed. It isn't that they have escaped. It isn't that they have detached. It is that their way of being involved doesn't come with a lot of verbiage compared to some of the other styles. Last but not least, there's a style that is sometimes referred to as the storytelling style, the narrative. And those are individuals who in the course of a conversation, a discussion, um, a process of trying to make a decision might use a story to explain what they think, what their choice is about the decision, what their contribution is. They may speak with in terms of metaphors and analogies and things of that sort. Now, the first thing to think about is when you get all of those styles together, and my wild guess is in almost every work situation, you have people who bring the, a different preferred style to the engagement. When people have not done that self-awareness assessment of even stopping and saying, what style do I prefer? They don't have that awareness. They don't even share that, you know what, I, I really kind of do like to have folks get to the point. Um, you put them in a group, they don't understand their own style. They would therefore may not be able to appreciate the styles of others. You could have some problems in engagement. In fact, these this issue of communication styles has a lot to do in the workplace with how planning occurs, how creativity is expressed, how conflict is managed. So the more we understand about ourselves, the better we understand in a situational sense what other people bring, the, the more likely we are to do planning that involves everyone to allow space for creativity that brings it out from everyone. And when there are issues, and of course there will be, are able to manage them with fewer arguments and misunderstandings. So I wanna give you an example and we're gonna move forward. How could this play out? Imagine you're on your campus and you're sitting in a room and a window is open and the breeze from Balboa Islands creeping through. So there's a, there's a temperature issue here that people may react to differently. A direct person who regards this as a cold room 
would say to the person sitting closest to the window, I'm kind of looking over here, hey, close that window. Very clear, right to the point, bada bing, bada boom. The indirect person might maybe kind of rub their, their shoulders and throw a question out to the group. Anyone cold in here? The intuitive person, if they're in their preferred style mode, may simply be quiet because they're pondering climate change. Is it happening? Is it not? What's the cause? So they're just kind of reflecting, not contributing verbally to this discussion. And the storyteller in the room might begin by telling everyone, you know what, back in Michigan, where the winters are wicked, this would be a summer breeze. In fact, let's open up the barbecue. I'm from Michigan. Uh, and in fact, for a while when I moved to California and people would complain about how cold it was and the temperature would say 70 or 65, there were moments when I did say, girl, you don't know what it was like in Michigan. So that's an example that's relatively harmless, but it is uh, a good way of illustrating what could happen. So before I ask you the next poll question, I'd like you to think about and just make a personal note. We're not gonna reveal this to anyone else. What style do you think is your preferred style based on the description that I gave you? I just want you to make a mental note. So this is gonna be a quickie. It's not even a Snapchat. This is a snap thought. Are you direct, indirect, intuitive? Or are you a storyteller? While they're doing that, Scott, let's get uh, the next poll up and ready, please. There you go. Here's your next poll question. What communication style is the norm? I think I wanna make sure, I'm gonna do an editorial here. It should say norm, not normal. So make sure you answer the question with that in mind. When I say norm, what I mean is the one that's most uh, uh, commonly seen here in the United States, especially in the workplace. So it is a normal. It is norm, quote unquote, N-O-R-M. What's the most common style? If you'd make your selection real quickly, we'll take a look at what you thought. Give you another 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Let's see if we can move this along. Okay, let's take a look, uh, Scott, at what our results are. Huh. So please, everyone, take a look at your screen. You're viewing the results of the poll. And uh, you can see here what you all think. And the, the choice with the largest percentage of selections is indirect, followed by direct. Intuitive is small percentage, and so is storytelling. So I want to say thank you for uh, taking a, a, a shot at this. 
And I will tell you that the norm is direct. The direct communication style here in the United States is what's encouraged. It is what is rewarded. And in many cases, especially when we come to the workplace, um, promotions, leaders, there is the notion that this direct style is the better style. And again, I wanna use that to distinguish from the, the notion of normal. Um, it is the one that is encouraged. It is the one that gets rewarded. It's, it's about getting out there, getting things done. So here in the United States, and again, in the workplace, what tends to be the person with the style that is direct is the one that oftentimes gets the attention is the one that can wind up leading a meeting, guiding it through. And people will actually comment in a positive way. He or she uh, took care of business. They got things done. And why is that? That's because we tend to hear these sayings that, be, that get drilled into us that we should cut to the chase, that time is money, that we should save time. And the notion is the direct style is the one that does that. Let me suggest to you that while it is true that this style may get the rewards, the recognition, and sometimes the erroneous notion that that style is the best one to get things done, the other styles are important contributors and should be, I'm gonna use the word should, should be incorporated into engagement, into meetings. So for example, if there are direct folks uh, or styles that are manifested or displayed in a meeting and the person who is facilitating or leading that meeting has that direct style, there is a responsibility one would say to make sure that the other styles are given an opportunity to contribute, that they are not ignored. That if you don't get uh, input verbally or in some other way, you know, hands-on experience, I mean, it, interaction, is that you take the time to check in and to make sure that those who maybe do not throw themselves into the conversation immediately are not left out by checking in with them and asking for their input. Slowing your flow long enough to let input flow in. So before I move on to our next video that I hope will be interesting to you, I'd like to stop and give you the opportunity to ask a question uh, or to comment either about the uh, emotional intelligence uh, piece of this, communication styles. Uh, did any of this ring a bell for you? Uh, how is it relevant to work as you see it? How is it relevant to engaging with your coworkers? And I really would like to encourage everyone to Raise your hand um, and comment or ask a question. I'm going to stop, use the power of silence, and hopefully someone will add to our discussion so it's not just my voice. Ah, I see some things in the chat, so I'm going to at least uh, deal with that and also uh, see if there's uh, anything anyone wants to say verbally. There's a question from Chris Williams. What are some strategies for listening to different styles of communication? Great uh, question. You're almost sort of like a tea leaf reader because in the next video and some following remarks, I'm going to try to give you a real quick sample of that. Um, Amy, 
put something in. I see these communication styles as situational too. Amy, you're here with us. I really like to have other people and me hear what you mean by that. You're willing to weigh in a little bit more? Amy, where are sure. you? Sure. Oh, okay. Amy, well, just, Amy, tell just us. Know, just knowing your audience and knowing the people that you're communicating with um, and knowing, again, what you talked about is each individual has different communication styles. So just kind of knowing who you're talking with and knowing those in the room. So it really is kind of it's situational. You don't want to be uh, indirect with a situation that's direct. Well, maybe or maybe not. But, you know, um, before I move on, Amy, I hope you don't mind me circling back and asking this question. How would you go about knowing who's in the room? What would be a strategy that you would use? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's as if you would know if you're in a, a meeting that you've worked with these individuals and just knowing over time how they can. And you know, by observation, listening, or a little bit of both. Correct. And who the, who's in the room. So yeah, who's in the room. In fact, uh, what I often time saying, it goes back to that situational awareness is one reading the room. So that's sort of using those observational skills. I will, but I will also say this, that just because again, you've got different styles represented in a room, in a meeting, in a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it doesn't automatically mean that it's gonna devolve into a wrestling match. Uh, it can actually be a great opportunity because what the studies and research and experience have shown is that when you mix it up and people are willing to live with this combination of um, different styles, you actually have great opportunity for growth, for learning. So you gotta have the will, the motivation to wanna hang in there and to be able to adapt as other people display their styles. And that doesn't mean you have to give up yours. I saw another hand up um, and I hope I haven't lost that person. Anyone else would like to throw in a comment or a reaction, a question, a challenge? Okay, here it is. Catherine, please. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess I just thought what Amy brought up was really um, relevant to, I think our particular situation at a community college because we have, um, we have various groups, you know, we have various stakeholders. We have um, that even as, not that everyone has similar styles in their groups, but I mean, we have management, we have faculty. We faculty, I find faculty a lot of times do um, tell stories <laughs> when I'm in, um, when I'm, you know, in meetings with faculty, not necessarily everybody, but I, I see that seems a little bit, maybe more common. Um, and so I just think it is interesting that, and I've worked in other, you know, just like all of us, I've worked in different, you know, um, places and, you know, I've worked in corporate environments where direct communication was very prevalent, but, um, I think it's, it's interesting how we're really quirky, I guess, in our community college system and, and our experience. And it, so it is a lot of different communication styles and we really do have to step back and allow everybody to have that space to communicate the way they do. So I don't know, I just thought that was interesting that Amy brought that up. Thanks both Amy for starting us off and Catherine for um, following up. And you're right, I don't want to dismiss the notion that when you're in different settings and there are different objectives, agendas that have to be attended to from a different perspective, that it's, it is strategic and wise to know who the audience is. Uh, and sometimes audience is not the same as participant. So when you're, you're involved with the academic side, and, and of course it's interesting, Kazreen, you, you said they tell stories and some would argue it's because they like the sound of their voice, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, you gotta think about it. If you were making a presentation, I suspect that if and when um, Scott Ferguson Green has to talk about CSEA, issues with HR uh, or with the board of trustees, 
he might have to roll a little differently than when he talks about what he's negotiating on your behalf with a meeting of classified staff. Safe bet, there may be different things. Uh, folks who are making decisions and it has to do with money, 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 and other things like that, they're looking for probably data. It might be that the direct approach is the best one for that audience and maybe for academics. Um, you tell them a story. I would not want to guarantee that you would still be understood, but perhaps that's a possibility. So your style is what is an, of interest here. And so now I am going to ask you, if you are willing, if you put what you think your preferred style is in the chat and we can take a look at it, we'll get a chance to see about the diversity of communication styles in this room, your style. And if you're willing to put it in there, we can look at the cross section of diversity that we have right here on a Friday afternoon. I see an intuitive up there. I've seen some indirect, okay. Let's kind of weigh in on this, throw it in. Direct. Uh, Farnows, I'll come to you in just a second. I wanna have everybody weigh in on this and I'll come back and see what you would like to add. Indirect, direct, indirect. We've got a cross section here so far. Anyone else wanna share what they think they prefer? Indirect, indirect. Very interesting. Direct. Thank you, Elsa. We got Sarah with the mix it up. Depends on the situation and the person. We want your preference. We understand you're thinking of situations. Aha, aha, direct. Anyone else want to weigh in? We got a, we've got a mix. Direct, direct. I agree with Sarah. I like direct, but I like stories. All right, Kathleen. Thank you, Doris. Okay, direct. It seems like the largest percentage, the greatest number of um, contributions to this point lean in the direction of direct. So I'm gonna move on with that. And um, again, say this and Farnas, don't lose your thought. Direct is what is valued. It means that in fact, if I can say this and I hope you will understand it, um, when people come from all around the world and, and arrive here on the shores of the United States, their, their cultural upbringing may have informed and built a particular communication style. We do know in doing studies about interpersonal communication, that cultural values and experience, role models and messages uh, inform the kind of style that you develop. So people can come from other parts of the world where indirect intuitive or storytelling styles are actually valued more, rewarded, reinforced, expected. And then when you come here, what happens? The context that you're in modifies what that preference might be. You may actually, some people at work display one style and when they're away from work, you see a, a whole other one. So I want you to keep that in mind. Farnaz, I hope you haven't lost your thought. Please unmute and tell us what you'd like to share. No, I appreciate the chance. Um, I have a feeling that we're all pretty much intuitive first because you have to kind of get an idea and feed for where you're at, what is happening, is it important to you? Because it's kind of subjective. Um, you know, let's say you're in a training, is this something that deals uh, with my everyday stuff? And, um, you know, should I be putting in my dime's worth or not? Um, you know, am I gonna take the direct approach and say, this is what I need, but where am I in this position? You know, my boss is here in this meeting and she has the right of way, right? So this is just an example. Um, I, uh, I put subjective because it just depends. Uh, and I think we all kind of weigh it out before we, we speak our mind. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, Farnaz. 
And um, you have a very positive, uh, optimistic uh, perspective on human nature and human involvement. And I don't want to be totally Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, Debbie Downer. What I will say to you is that things that, that we know about situations that occur at work is that many times people have not taken the time to think this through. Um, and if they have had no reason to, if they've been able to kind of navigate their world with whatever that preferred style is, they move along and in some cases have little if any opportunity to think about it. And the other is that sometimes this can, these kinds of distinctions become big differences that lead to uh, divisiveness. And so it's really, that's why it's important to stop and think about it. And um, appreciate that people start from different places. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, sort of a, a one thought that everyone begins with the reflective, intuitive or subjective perspective. And there's, there's another thought that maybe not necessarily so. Uh, this is all worth consideration. And it's also, again, why I would encourage you, uh, not that I, I think you have a lot of time on your hands, but besides being able to assess your emotional intelligence, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have the opportunity to also take different assessments. I would just say, make sure that they seem credible. If uh, you get an assessment for communication styles from a Mad Magazine edition, some of you might not even know what that magazine is, I wouldn't suggest that's a credible source. So something to think about. Let's look at, before we get into a breakout room, because I wanna have you all have an opportunity to think about what we've share, I've shared so far uh, and talk about a particular um, topic for a moment in a breakout room. I'd like to have you look at another video that I hope would highlight many of the things that I'm talking about now. So I'm gonna stop my share. Scott, you are hopefully ready to show everyone the next video. All right, I wanna see a show of hands. How many of you have unfriended someone on Facebook because they said something offensive about politics or religion, childcare, food? <laughs> And how many of you know at least one person that you avoid because you just don't want to talk to them? <laughs> you know, it used to be that in order to have a polite conversation, we just had to follow the advice of Henry Higgins and My Fair Lady, stick to the weather and your health. But these days, with climate change and anti-vaxxing, those subjects <laughs> are not safe either. So this world that we live in, this world in which Every conversation has the potential to devolve into an argument where our politicians can't speak to one another and where even the most trivial of issues have someone fighting both passionately for it and against it. It's not normal. Pew Research did a study of 10,000 American adults, and they found that at this moment, we are more polarized, we are more divided than we ever have been in history. We're less likely to compromise, which means we're not listening to each other, and we make decisions about where to live, who to marry, and even who our friends are going to be based on what we already believe. Again, that means we're not listening to each other. A conversation requires a balance between talking and listening, and somewhere along the way, we lost that balance. Now, part of that is due to technology, the smartphones that you all either have in your hands or close enough that you could grab them really quickly. According to Pew Research, about a third of American teenagers send more than 100 texts a day. And many of them, almost most of them, are more likely to text their friends than they are to talk to them face to face. There's this great piece in The Atlantic, it was written by a high school teacher named Paul Barnwell, and he gave his kids a communication project. He wanted to teach them how to speak on a specific subject without using notes. And he said this, I came to realize... <laughs> 
I came to realize that conversational competence might be the single most overlooked skill we fail to teach. Kids spend hours each day engaging with ideas and each other through screens, but rarely do they have an opportunity to hone their interpersonal communication skills. It might sound like a funny question, but we have to ask ourselves: Is there any 21st-century skill more important than being able to sustain, sustain coherent, confident conversation? Now, I make my living talking to people: Nobel Prize winners, truck drivers, billionaires, kindergarten teachers, heads of state, plumbers. I talk to people that I like. I talk to people that I don't like. I talk to some people that I disagree with deeply on a personal level, but I still have a great conversation with them. So I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so teaching you how to talk and how to listen. Many of you have already heard a lot of advice on this. Things like look the person in the eye, think of interesting things, topics to discuss in advance, look,、uh, nod and smile to show that you're paying attention. <laughs> Uh, repeat back what you just heard, or summarize it. So I want you to forget all of that. It is crap. <laughs> There is no reason to learn how to show you're paying attention if you are, in fact, <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> Now I actually use the exact same skills as a professional interviewer that I do in regular life.、Um, so. I'm going to teach you how to interview people, and that's actually going to help you learn how to be better conversationalists. Learn to have a conversation without wasting your time, without getting bored, and please God, without offending anybody. We've all had really great conversations. We've had them before. We know what it's like—the kind of conversation where you walk away feeling engaged and inspired, or where you feel like you've made a real connection, or you've been perfectly understood. There is no reason why most of your interactions can't be like that. So I have ten basic rules. I'm going to walk you through all of them. But honestly, if you just choose one of them and master it, you're already going to enjoy better conversations. Number one: don't multitask. And I don't mean just set down your cell phone or your tablet or your car keys or whatever's in your hand. I mean be present, be in that moment. Don't be thinking about your. Argument you have with your boss. Don't be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. If you want to get out of the conversation, get out of the conversation. But don't be half in it and half out of it. Number two, don't pontificate. If you wanted to state your opinion without any opportunity for response or argument or pushback or growth, write a blog. <laughs> Now, there's a really good reason why I don't allow pundits on my show because they're really boring. If they're a conservative, they're going to hate Obama and food stamps and abortion. If they're a liberal, they're going to hate big banks and oil corporations and Dick Cheney. <laughs> totally predictable. And you don't want to be like that. You need to enter every conversation assuming that you have something to learn. The famed therapist Eb Scott Peck said that true listening requires a setting aside of oneself. And sometimes that means setting aside your personal opinion. He said that sensing this acceptance, the speaker will become less and less vulnerable and more and more likely to open up the inner recesses of his or her mind to the listener. Again, assume that you have something to learn. Bill Nye, everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. I put it this way: everybody is an expert in something. Number three. Use open-ended questions. In this case, take a cue from journalists. Start your questions with who, what, where, when, why, or how. If you put in a complicated question, you're going to get a simple answer out. If I ask you, "Were you terrified?", you're going to respond to the most powerful word in that sentence, which is "terrified." And the answer is, "Yes, I was," or "No, I wasn't." Were you angry? Yes, I was very angry. Let them describe it. They're the ones that know. Try asking them things like, "What was that like? How did that feel?" Because then they might have to stop for a moment and think about it, and you're going to get a much more interesting response. Number four, go with the flow. That means thoughts will come into your mind, and you need to let them go out of your mind. We've heard interviews often in which a guest is talking for several minutes, and then the host comes back in and asks a question which seems like it comes out of nowhere or it's already been answered. That means the host probably stopped listening two minutes ago because he thought of this really clever question, 
And he was just bound and determined to say that. And we do the exact same thing. We're sitting there having a conversation with someone, and then we remember that time that we met Hugh Jackman in a coffee shop, <laughs> and we stop listening. Stories and ideas are going to come to you. You need to let them come and let them go. Number five: If you don't know, say that you don't know. Now, people on the radio, especially on NPR, are much more aware that they're going on the record. And so they're more careful about what they claim to be an expert in and what they claim to know for sure. Do that. Err on the side of caution. Talk should not be cheap. Number six: Don't equate your experience with theirs. If they're talking about having lost a family member, don't start talking about the time that you lost a family member. If they're talking about the trouble that they're having at work, don't tell them about how much you hate your job. It's not the same. It is never the same. All experiences are individual, and more importantly, it is not about you. You don't need to take that moment to prove how amazing you are or how much you've suffered. Somebody asked Stephen Hawking once what his IQ was, and he says, "I have no idea. People who brag about their IQs are losers." <laughs> Conversations are not a promotional opportunity. <laughs> Number seven. <laughs> Try not to repeat yourself. It's condescending and it's really boring, and we tend to do it a lot, especially in work conversations or in conversations with our kids. We have a point to make, so we just keep rephrasing it over and over. <laughs> don't do that. Number eight: Stay out of the weeds. Frankly, people don't care about the years, the names, the dates, all those details that you're struggling to come up with in your mind. They don't care. What they care about is you. They care about what you're like, what you have in common. So forget the details, leave them out. Number nine. This is not the last one, but it is the most important one. Listen. I cannot tell you how many really important people have said that listening is perhaps the most, the number one most important skill that you could develop. Buddha said, and I'm paraphrasing, "If your mouth is open, you're not learning." And Calvin Coolidge said. No man ever listened his way out of a job. <laughs> Why do we not listen to each other? Number one, we'd rather talk. When I'm talking, I'm in control. I don't have to hear anything I'm not interested in. I'm the center of attention. I can bolster my own identity. But there's another reason: we get distracted. The average person talks at about 225 words per minute, but we can listen at up to 500 words per minute. So our minds are filling in those other 275 words. And look, I know it takes effort and energy to actually pay attention to someone. But if you can't do that, you're not in a conversation. You're just two people shouting out barely related sentences in the same place. <laughs> you have to, you have to listen to one another. Stephen Covey said it very beautifully. He said, "Most of us don't listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply." One more rule, and number ten, and it's this one: be brief. <laughs> All of this boils down to the same basic concept, and it is this one: be interested in other people. You know, I grew up with a very famous grandfather, and there was kind of a ritual in my home: people would come over to talk to my grandparents. And after they would leave, my mother would come over to us, and she'd say, "Do you know who that was? She was the runner-up to Miss America. He was the mayor of Sacramento. She won a Pulitzer Prize. He's a Russian ballet dancer." And I started, I kind of grew up assuming everyone has some hidden amazing thing about them. And I, honestly, I think it's what makes me a better host. I keep my mouth shut as often as I possibly can. I keep my mind open, and I'm always prepared to be amazed. And I'm never disappointed. You do the same thing. Go out, talk to people, listen to people, and most importantly, be prepared to be amazed. Thanks. Okay, as we go back, thanks, Scott. Thanks for the input as well. Those of you who helped us navigate this,、um, we're about to get into what I hope will be a fruitful, though brief, discussion amongst yourselves and some small groups.、Uh, and you know, I hope that、uh, 
Celeste Headley maybe offered one idea, two ideas that are worth thinking about, just digesting. Uh, when we think about our situational uh, awareness, how do we navigate that? How, what do we pay attention to? Um, those are all, I think there are a number of different things that we could take away from that. And she has a book, uh, this was done in 2015. She came out with a book, and I want to say 2019, maybe 10 ways to have uh, a conversation. I like it because if you're looking at the screen, you see my fingers, it is a really short read, straightforward, simple, that can be helpful. You know, I'll, sh I'll share a story because I am a bit of a storyteller and people do think that, especially in the world of training and facilitation, it helps. You know, as a trainer and a facilitator, probably that, that part of the emotional intelligence one of reading the room is one that we're constantly working on and also having to modify and having to think about what we're paying attention to. And so when uh, Celeste Headley talked about, you don't have to um, present the signs of paying attention if you're paying attention. What we wind up doing in the world of training, development and facilitation is we are kind of looking for those cues. And we also have to learn that uh, what comes across and what we see in the training room face-to-face -face or on Zoom doesn't necessarily mean that people are not paying attention. So I do a lot of work um, as a community involved person here in Los Angeles and particularly in the city of Santa Monica where I uh, live. And so I was doing some presentations for the League of Women Voters uh, about different ways of doing strategic planning and what have you. One of their members uh, includes a former mayor and some other folks. So I have a PowerPoint it's up, I got stuff on the screen. And throughout my presentation, the former mayor who's an activist and everyone loves this person, she's a great lady, um, contributes to the community in her own way, was knitting throughout my entire presentation. There were a few moments when she would lift her head and look at the screen, or she might throw a comment out. And so at the end, this is something that can be done in a situation. I, I wanted to circle back to her because I had taken away the cues of what I saw visually, that this was a person as I'm doing a two hour presentation who actually almost knitted a pair of socks. And I wanted to make sure she was still in the room and that she, she heard things. So we had, in this case, and it was in front of the whole group, a little bit of an exchange. Uh, I, were you with me? What did you think about it? And she went on to explain. This, essentially, she is kind of an intuitive communicator. She's a reflective listener. And as she uh, is part of a presentation like the one that I was given, giving, the best way for her to digest things wasn't necessarily to lift her head up and look at the screen. It was to focus on this knitting and um, listen. So that's those moments where you have an opportunity, one, self-awareness to know what it is you're paying attention to. And then second, in a situation to try to figure out is what you're seeing meaning what you think it means or does it mean something else? And those moments when you can have that connection um, are invaluable. So at the beginning of the session, there was a question in the chat and I, let me stop because Chelsea, you had a comment and I, my no, brain is going fast. No, that's okay. And we're almost out of time. That's okay. No, go ahead. Roll well, I, I just, um, I was just gonna, I think Mark hit the nail on the head and we discussed this. We were actually in a group together of, um, that it's not about ego and what you echoed and what that last video is about is listen to um, understand, not to have your answer. Uh, she said it more eloquently than I just did. Um, but I, and I think that plays off of what Katie was saying too, is sometimes students come in and they can be very upset. And the first thing they really need is to have someone finally just kind of slow down with them 
and listen to them, really hear, they just want to be heard for the first time. And it's hard to not, you know, if I've had a student come up or a coworker, it's hard to not get in your head and think, okay, what, how do I start? You try to start fixing it immediately without continuously listening or who do I need to take this to or who do I need to bring in or, um, and so I, we were saying a mixture of that and then also just a mixture of anxiety of, of possibly knowing, you know, I used to be a high school English teacher and I didn't like going in a normal order because then I felt like as it came out, you kind of knew when you were up next. And so you stopped paying attention and you were just preparing to answer because you knew you were next in line. Yeah, yeah and I, you know, and, and it's not only high schoolers that are kind of prepped to get ready when they know their next <laughs> and to shut down right after they're done. Uh, were, I wish it were true, but as people become adults, they still continue to do that. And uh, that's something that's really important to keep in mind, not only for how you can adjust, but you know what, you can try to hope that um, other people will be mindful of. So thank you very much for that. Is there anyone else that um, would like to just throw in their comments? Because this is the opportunity to give us a little bit of a snapshot about um, any uh, anything from the group discussion or the previous information. Scott, tell me if I missed an, a hand. I'm moving along here. As of now, I don't see any. Is okay. I'm going to, in the interest of time, move on. So again, the, the question was, well, what are the strategies? What do we do? And this summarizes most of what has been said, either by me uh, or in the video or by you. Uh, the uh, emphasis on listening and taking your ego out of it as much as possible is really important. The uh, and so with all of this, there are strategies, the self-awareness, the checking what you're thinking to make sure you're correct, uh, thinking about your perceptions and making sure your interpretation of them is accurate. But the last two are the ones, because once again, um, it is about a process and progress. It's not about perfection. I've repeated myself and said that more than once. Celeste would probably um, spank my hand. So recalibrating, practicing becomes the way that you can get to a better place. So these are food for thought. I'll let you take a look. The upper left-hand corner might remind some people of the serenity prayer. Um, the lower left-hand corner is just advice for practical purposes. I will emphasize the lower right-hand corner, because this again is something that I think people are not aware of. And um, we are finding with research across the board, driven by people who are from different disciplines, uh, neuroscience, social science, technology, performance assessors, experts in leadership and executive work, that the emotional quotient, that emotional intelligence has found to account for at least 60% of performance in all jobs. Account for meaning that it is the contributing factor to the type of performance that people demonstrate. And what some studies have shown is that high performers tend to be high on EQ. Teams that are high performance teams have members with high EQ. And if there's anything that I can suggest to you, it is this, that this is about self-awareness and situational management and situational awareness. It isn't about whether you got an A in engineering school, social work, business. So it isn't expertise in the area in which you work that matters as much to your success and performance as it is these other behavioral science, social science factors. So in business schools, emotional intelligence has become a subject matter and you know, it's presented in a variety of different ways. It is a piece of what folks uh, are focused on. There's a guy who wrote a great 
book a long time ago that's still considered a reference. Uh, what they didn't tell you in Harvard Business School or something like that, Mark McCormick is his name, I believe. He began this trend of having people in business school recognize that people skills could be the difference between whether they excel to a higher salary, a bigger position. Those things that you can understand and grasp in that area have as much impact, if not more, on your career tra trajectory, your comfort at work, the comfort other people have with you. So I just hope that, you know, that provides you with some considerations. When your EQ is, is working, when communication is rocking, uh, your engagement changes. And those three factors that you see are some of the ways in which it changes. People are more included in crisis management, strategic planning, day-to-day -day operations. There's greater collaboration. There is from that also an, Im, an impact on creativity. And you have the connection where you get to, to know the people that you work with in a way um, that is helpful to engagement. The PowerPoint will be sent to you by Scott Green. I listed a couple things here that you might be interested in and there's so much more. Uh, emotion, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 is really a very small book. I think I might've mentioned it. That came out in 2009. It's easy to digest, I would say, and it provides you with an opportunity to assess your EQ. The implicit association test is something I, I'm sharing because another thing that affects how people engage are the thoughts that we have about them, the perceptions that we have about them, the assumptions that we make about them. And um, the IAT is an interesting way to measure how you might think about people based on different aspects of their identity. So uh, I wanna see uh, in closing this out, I have, we have about three or four minutes. Would anyone like to comment about uh, something that they are taking away from today's session that they might think about or try to share with other people? Please raise your hand. See, I'll take a look and see if anyone's hand is up. Comment about uh, the information. Oh, okay. I, see, I see two hands. I'm going to start with Elsa and then I'll follow with Chris. Go ahead, Elsa, please. Hi, I just want to say that um, I think I want to remember most um, the listening while someone's talking to you versus uh, strategizing what you're going to say, preparing for your response, because you lose so much when you do that. And not only was that mentioned in the video, that woman described it well. But then it was even even came up in our group, and I think it had impact on a lot of people. And so I really want to hold on to that because I, I find myself doing that, whether it's in a meeting or even with my teenage daughter. <laughs> and it's just a great thing to stop and just really be present. Thank you, also for sharing. Chris, please unmute yourself. I was thinking that uh, listening and that. All that's good, but for me, it's just about practicing the skills to get better at them. Intellectually, I think we all get the gist. It's just the challenge of practicing it, I think, is the hardest thing for me. I don't know. Uh, thank you. Practice can get to perfect. Um, so both of the comments from Elsa about listening and, and Chris about um, practicing are important. And I would, I would say that this is going to sound kind of like a jibber jabber, um, but that it is your head and your heart that have to kind of go into this, or at least I would encourage you to think about that as being um, part of the equation. Um, there has to be the interest, the will, going all the way back to the beginning of the session, the motivation and mindfulness of that. And 
that um, is informed by what we know intellectually and it is pushed by what we feel in our heart. So uh, something to think about. Uh, Chris, do you still want to add something? Your hand is still up and I'm happy to go for nope, it. No, I just don't know how to use the internet as well as I should. Okay, we, we understand. Anyone else want to add anything uh, about the, the uh, topics and the content that you'd like to share with uh, the rest of the folks? Well, I, I appreciate your, your participation. As I said before, at the start of the session, I'm glad you're here and that you stuck with us and uh, look forward to getting the PowerPoint from Scott after all of this is done. And uh, I hope you'll have a good, safe weekend and uh, that I provided you with some food for thought. It's been my pleasure to, to have served as your facilitator and thank you for being here. Well, we wanna thank Dr. Gunn for her presentation. This is part two. Uh, we are going to have part three on Friday, October 8th, and I will send out an, a, an announcement for that, plus also, you know, the links that will be again for the morning and afternoon session on that day. Um, I apologize for the second video. Uh, I could see it on my desktop, and but didn't know that you could only hear it and not see it. One thing we've learned about Zoom over the last 18 months, anything can happen. But we wanna thank Mark Levinson and some of the others for their suggestions so that everybody could see that wonderful video. I will be sending out uh, those videos with Dr. Gunn's permission so that um, you are able to go over it again and catch all the information from uh, each of those videos. So once again, thank you very much for participating. Um, we look forward to seeing you for part three on October 8th. And um, please have a very, very safe weekend, everyone. And we'll see you next week at the chapter meeting. And uh, everyone should know I couldn't have done this without Scott's help. It's been tremendous. So take good care of you want to be safe. You might want to play the video from Celeste before you have a family gathering at a holiday. It might help to uh, have a nice smooth flow to your exchange. <laughs> Take care. Peace. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.